Well, good evening. It's good to see you this evening. We are grateful that you are here for our Garrett Lecture this year, and we are pleased to be able to have this opportunity to present uh, this lecture, and I am especially pleased that uh, the family of Herman and Mary Elizabeth Garrett who established this. Uh, we have them here, Rick Garrett and Debbie Oliver here to my right. We want to say thank you uh, for this. Would you join me in thanking them for this lecture series that they've established? <laughs> Dr. Blackwell will be our fourth uh, lecturer that we've had since this was established and it's just been a wonderful time. I think everyone has enjoyed it. And uh, we have just been blessed. And I can tell you that you're going to be blessed tonight. Uh, you have a very special speaker uh, that is going to share with us tonight. He is extremely wise. And he knows a lot about Baptist life. But he also knows a lot about life in general. And one of the things you'll first notice about Dr. Michael Blackwell is he has a wonderful speaking, speaking voice. He started at age 14 as a DJ working at a radio station, and, uh, and he has a wonderful voice. He went to the University of North Carolina. Uh, he worked at a radio station while a student there and also wrote for the Daily Tar Heel. He is a gifted speaker, a gifted writer, uh, a true Baptist statesman, a person who is respected by all, and that's hard to find in Baptist life, I can tell you that. Uh, he has been uh, the president and CEO of North Carolina Baptist Children's Home for 36, 36 years, and uh, we are just grateful to have him. Also with him tonight is Jim Edmondson, and Jim, we welcome you back as well. Jim has been with us a couple of times before from the children's home and the last time he brought some children with him and uh, we just had a delightful time. So tonight, of all the many things that Dr. Blackwell could share with us, he has written five books and his latest book is Above the Clouds, Nine Essentials for Thriving at the Peak. And so he's gonna be sharing with us from this book uh, tonight, and he has been gracious enough to bring books for each of you. So following our uh, time tonight, you can get a complimentary uh, book from Dr. Blackwell, and he will be here to sign those books as well, and we uh, certainly do appreciate that. And this lecture is going to be a bit different. He has had to make a true effort to be here, and I think most people would probably have canceled out on me, and I really appreciate the fact that he has not. He had a birthday on Friday, so we had to work with his family around birthday arrangements, and he has a knee replacement scheduled for May 20th, so you pray for him as he has that done. <laughs> the left knee, pray for that left knee. But you're in for a treat tonight. And I would ask that you help me welcome Dr. Michael Blackwell here to Roxborough Baptist Church. Well, thank you, Dr. Dupree Sanders. It's a joy to be here tonight. Now, Carter, did you hear what I was doing when I was 14, your age? <laughs> I was already on the radio in the golden days of early rock and roll. Elvis Presley, Little Richard, Lloyd Price. Some of you may not know any of these names whatsoever, but those were great years, and I'm going to be looking to you, Carter, to keep a good thing going. So, J.D., you see to it, okay? <laughs> Janine said she remembered me from my days at WKIX in Raleigh. Now, that goes a way, way back, at least to 1965, somewhere along in there. I didn't know anybody was still alive that used to hear me uh, on the radio, but I, and you did too. Well, probably if I asked two or three of you did in here, but I worked at television when I was in seminary. I met my wife at a radio station in Charlotte in 1965, and we met over the, the Xerox machine. I don't even know if they know make Xerox machines anymore, but she was down uh, at working at a radio station called WAYS, 
Big Ways Radio, and I was the news director, C. Michael Blackwell. You ever heard of Big Ways, anybody? C. Michael Blackwell, Big Ways News, at your service. I can't help myself sometimes. I just go back in time like that. But I've been married 52 years, and I think somebody over here has been married 56 years. Anybody can beat 56 years? 66. How many? 66. Route 66. <laughs> I had a birthday two days ago, and uh, Jim Edmondson uh, took off on that theme, except mine was Route 77. And uh, it was 77. Now, you got to tell me, do I look at Janine? No. Thank you, dear. I appreciate that. But I, I love what I do. I have enjoyed getting to know Dupree and his pastoral abilities, his storytelling abilities. And coming up in July, when I celebrate my 36th anniversary as BCH president, of course, Dupree will be celebrating his 20th anniversary here. And that's a, that's a great milestone. And I congratulate the two of you because I know that it is a partnership and uh, with you and your wife and your two sons, and thank you for being here for that long. Ray Howell uh, is a great friend of mine, and uh, Brother Clay down at the Baptist Foundation is also a dear friend of mine, so I go way back with his church. I was having something called a laminectomy a couple of years ago and was scheduled to be here, and that's when Jim Edmondson came up. I had arranged for our girls from our Camp Duncan for girls to be here, and Jim came back with such a glowing report about the fine people here, the good fellowship, the lunch that you had for the girls, and just opening up your arms in a usual and traditional way that you have done for decades, going back to when you were here and your husband was here as pastor so many, many years. There are some essentials to living. You can't go back and make a new beginning, but you can look ahead and create a good ending. This is where a lot of us are today, in which we are celebrating in many ways more sunsets in our lives than we are sunrises. And you know what that metaphor is all about. I also know that for me, the creative gene is still bubbling. My dream machine keeps on going and going and going, and I think all the time, and so all of these essentials of relationship building, of knowing who you are, of knowing if, as a young person how you want to start out, because the way you start out is the way you're going to end up. And the person you are destined to become is the per person that you believe you're going to be. The person you are destined to become is the person you decide to be. So to those of you who are young or young at heart, start out the way you want to end up. I have told my staff for 36 years now that school is never out for the pro, never out for the professional. There's always something new to learn, always something new to experience, always a new adventure. Keep on growing, keep on loving, keep on laughing because the best is truly yet to be. Those of us who have some years on our life and still have life in our years know what a gift it is to simply be able to wake up in the morning, to turn over and roll out of bed and get up and say, this is a good day because this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. Every day is a gift. And what I do every day now, and I would challenge you to do, is this. At the end of the day, I will ask myself, what did I do today to make life better? What did I do today to make life better? In my case, what did I do today to make life better for children, and now adults, because we have a North Carolina Baptist aging ministry, and I met a couple of folks here that I met a number of years ago at the Noel Retreat down at Caraway. 
We are now ministering to those from basically the cradle to the grave. We have a family care ministry with mothers who have little babies. We have a home for teenage mothers and their babies. And then we have the North Carolina Baptist Aging Ministry. 22 locations in North Carolina, an orphanage in Guatemala, 32,000 lives we touch every year. 32,000. We have an outreach ministry now based out of Thomasville called the Tucker Outreach Center in which thousands of people are helped. We have food roundup. We have on Tuesday of this coming week, we're going to be dedicating a brand new education center for our boys and girls, the girls that you got to see from Camp Duncan. We're going to have an education center right there between those two camps down in Moore County in which they can come and they can learn and they can explore and they can discover new truths about God and about themselves and they will know that that Ammons Education Center has been built because of women and men and young people at Roxborough Baptist Church. Have no doubt about it. These children know who you are, they know what you represent, and they know that you love them. One of the essentials of life that everybody has experienced one time or another, and these children have experienced in great detail, is trauma. Every child in care has experienced trauma. So much of that trauma has been sexual trauma or sexual exploitation. How many days has it been since you either picked up a newspaper or turned on the television and seen that somebody, some parent, some step-parent, some aunt, some uncle, some friend has been arrested for sexually abusing, molesting, or killing a child? It's about every day these days that you see it. So trauma is one thing that we need to accept that sometimes happens in all of our lives. Think back maybe in your own life. It may have happened when you were a child. It may have happened when you were a young adult. It may have happened and it could be something that is still with you today. What we try to say to these children is here is a way that you can handle this trauma which has marked your life. A few years ago, I was speaking at Woodlawn Baptist Church up in Conover. And we were talking about some of the essentials of living. And one of those is, is forgiveness. And the service that day involved one of the young women who had grown up at the Baptist Children's Homes. Her name is Roberta. And she was taking, talking about the insufferable abuse physically and emotionally and verbally that she had when her mother actually chose her boyfriend over her. At the end of that service, because it struck a chord with so many people, a man my age, 77 years old, came up to me in tears and said, Dr. Blackwell, today for the first time, I forgave my mother. Can you imagine? Because his mother had always told him he was dumb and stupid and lazy and would never amount to a hill of beans. He heard that when he was four. And he heard it when he was 14. And 24 and 34 and 54 and long after she died, you're stupid. And she went to her grave saying that she hated the day he was born. Can you imagine? And he said that day, I forgive my mother. Tears, 77, streaming down his cheeks. So forgiveness is one of the essentials in life. It's one of the great essentials in life because though you may be holding on to something out of your past that you don't even think the other person remembers and they probably don't, you are still hanging on to it. A, a grudge, a word, a rejection, something somewhere that you just can't let go of. 
a few years ago, there was a movie, and I can't even remember the name of it now, but my grandchildren have seen it about 110 times. And in there, there's a little song, and it's called Let It Go, Let It Go, Let It Go. What's the name of that movie? Frozen. 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 So the other day, I'm with my 11-year-old. And I'm getting all agitated about something. And she says, Bobby. I said, yes, Piper. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go, Bobby. And then using very bad grammar, it ain't worth it, Bobby. It ain't worth it. And I'm going out of the mouth of babes. It's not worth it. Forgive where you need to forgive. Let it go. Because for somebody that may have hurt you all those many years ago, they've probably long since forgotten it. And it hurts you more than it ever hurt them. So put it behind you. That's an essential to let it go, forgiveness. I want to couch a lot of this under three general headings here. There are certain things that I want all of you to always do in your life. And that is to be absolutely persistent and never give up on your dreams. I said a few minutes ago that my dream machine is still bubbling. Jim and I were talking coming up here about some of the things that we want to do. He's got a great entrepreneurial spirit. So does Dupree. So do so many of you in here. We're beginning a podcast. I'm beginning to do monthly uh, videos. I still write. We have three major possible capital campaigns coming up. I'd like one of these days to be in our second uh, country uh, overseas. I have so many things that I want to do. Am I going to retire? I was looking in the Bible just before I came up here today, and I kept looking for words about retirement. <laughs> I hadn't seen any of that. Have you seen anything in the Bible about retiring? So I don't see why I need to even think about that. I may retread a little bit, but you've got to keep on keeping on. So many people, when they decide to retire, the two most difficult years of your life, and some of you may agree with me on this, the year you're born and the year you retire. Well, I got past that first year all right. Don't remember a thing about it. But I am not ready quite yet for that second year, that retirement year. I want to wake up one morning and say, now, what am I going to do now? So that's the importance of work. That's an essential, to do something that is productive, to believe in yourself, to believe that you are a child of God, that God made you, that you are efficient, that you are sufficient, that you are proficient. God's got his hand on you. God's got his hand on you saying, don't ever give up. Be persistent. You got something in mind, you need to keep at it. It was Churchill many, many years ago. And some of you will remember Winston Churchill, who through the sheer power of rhetoric, basically saved England during World War II saying that he would do everything that he could. He would fight anywhere. He would spill blood, sweat, toil, and tears to keep England out of that gutter snipe Hitler's reach. And England never gave up. Now, during World War II, he made a speech, later repeated. In 1988, my wife and I went to England, and we saw perhaps his most famous speech of all. He was an old man by then, barely could walk, corpulent, basically walking with a cane and with assistance, but he agreed. Now, speaking to an English audience is the toughest audience of all. And we were there in that great amphitheater where Churchill spoke. And he was introduced, and he hobbled to the microphone. And he leaned in. Never give up. Never give up. Never ever give up. 
And he turned and walked back and plopped down. And there was stone silence, which was the greatest compliment that a group of English students could ever give a speaker. Nothing. And then finally over here at one side, and that guide still had a quiver in his voice when he told the story. These kids, these students began to rise and shout and scream. And all the way across the amphitheater, they rose and screamed and shouted, we'll never give up, because they knew they had heard greatness. It does not matter to me how old you are. God is not through with you yet. There is a blue ribbon awaiting you. The finish line is yet to be. You cannot go back and create a new beginning, but you can create a great, great ending. So you be persistent, Whatever your dream may be, and I'll address this to everybody in here, but I want to say this to some of the young people who are here today. Do not mind wherever you are to dream that impossible dream. You and I have knee replacement surgery coming up within a week of one another. So we're going to be fine. I want your cell phone number because yours is first, and I'm going to call you, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to have this one done, and I'm going to have this one done, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to jump up and down right here at this church, and I'm going to show you that I never gave up. That which in your life. Do what? Consider yourself invited to do that at the end. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was afraid he was going to do that. You may have an impossible dream, and it can be truly impossible. It can even be intimidating at times. But I want to tell you, if you never give up, that which was impossible will eventually become improbable. Hmm. Not quite yet there, but not in that realm of, I can't do this. And by the way, when you say, I can't do this, knock the T off a of can't and say, I can do this. And so that which was impossible will become improbable. And then the goal line is there. And you will cross the goal line in that which was impossible. That which was improbable is now inevitable. You made it. You cross the finish line. You're zooming on. Nothing's going to stop you now. Persistence. Never, ever give up. Never give in. Never give over. That's one of the essentials of life. And then timing. Timing. There are a couple of uh, kinds of, 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 of time. Kronos is, is, is 726. That's clock time. Kairos is God's time. That's the fullness of time. I don't really care too much about what time it is right now, except what's God's time in my life. What is Kairotic time? What is Kairos? Can I be on the lookout for God speaking to me, giving me a tap on the shoulder? Just be aware. The greatest thing that you can do in your life is to be self-aware. To know who you are, to know what your strengths are, to know what your shortcomings are, and then to realize that when God taps you on the shoulders, that when opportunity knocks, don't knock the opportunity. This may be God saying, I need you. I want you. I want you to be even better than you are right now. Too many people today go to their graves with their music still inside them and with their poetry yet to be written. Oh, I want you to sing your song. I want you to play your song. 
before the music is over. You be aware for that chirotic moment when God taps you on the shoulder and says, I need you. Timing. And then attitude covers a lot of these essentials in here. There was a word coined a few years ago by a writer down in Chapel Hill. Uh, the word was positivity. You know, positivity. Just to, just to think positive. Uh, there's an old song, again, I can't remember. You've got to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. Well, that's a good song. It's an old song, but it's a good song. Don't mess with Mr. In-Between. So that's where I want you to be. Think positive. What are the things that's good that's going to happen? You know, I've been in all 100 counties now over these last 36 years, preaching, teaching, begging money, doing anything I can for children and their families. I think we ought to pass the plate again here tonight. <laughs> but I love to do that. I love to tell the old story. It will be my theme and glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love for his children, which includes you. I want you to think about things that could be. Don't go around saying that, oh, my goodness, why? Why did that happen? Nope. That's not for you. Janine, you're going to look ahead. And you're going to say, why not? Why not? There's something out there right now that's got my name on it. I see too many people today with their eyes cast down. Gloom, doom, discouraged, depressed, demoralized, dumped on. They feel alone. They feel lonely. Who cares? Who knows about me? Well, God does. Dupree Sanders does. People sitting with you know about you, value you, love you. You are a lovable bunch. You are a huggable bunch. And I want at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hugs before I get out of here tonight. <laughs> I thrive on hugs. So when I see people cast down and I look around for what is the antidote for that, it's you. Because when these people believe that life has treated them wrong, that nobody cares whether they live or die, and then they meet somebody like you, Somebody who's got a, a gleam in their eye, who's got Christ in their heart. They say, I want to be around that person because they've got something essential in life, and I want it. So I'm telling you, somebody's looking at you. It may be your spouse. It may be a son, a daughter, a grandchild. It may be a niece, a nephew, it may be somebody you don't even know, but they're saying right now, if it's okay for them to say this, act like this way, talk this way, then it's okay for me to act like this and talk like this. So you be above reproach. You be who you need to be. You be God's child. And you know that God is in you and God is for you and God is going to be with you. And for those of you who sometimes do feel does it really matter anymore? I just feel like throwing it in. I say, no, no, no. You hang on. Keep your eye on the prize. That's an essential of life. And for those of you who are here tonight saying that I still want to be inspired, I want to do what I can do, even if I have to perspire to be inspired, I want to do it and I want to work. I say, right on. Keep your eye on the prize. You be positive. You stand tall. You square your shoulders back. And you keep on 
keeping on. You have that great positive attitude. You take advantage of God's time and you make sure that your glass is always half full and not half empty. Those are some of the essentials of life for you. Thank you. So let me ask you some questions about your book. And first of all, the title, Above the Clouds, Nine Essentials for Thriving at the Peak. One of the questions I have is, how do you know that you have arrived at the peak? You never arrive totally, but there does come that point in your life when you feel that I have accomplished something. I set out to do something and my life has mattered. Now the thing is, it's like a, a peak experience. You know what Maslow calls that self-actualization time. It's like when the disciples went up into the, the Mount of Transfiguration and they saw Christ transfigured. They said, I want to stay here. I, don't, I want to stay here this peak experience. But you know you have to come back down. And after a peak experience is often a letdown. But you know sometimes when you have gotten there. And you also know that a peak is usually followed by a valley. So you want to keep on keeping a good thing going. If you have had those peak experiences, continue to thrive. That's why you have to be curious. For me, it's what's just around the corner? What's the next great thing I can do for old people in NC BAM, the North Carolina Baptist Aging Ministry? What's the next best thing I can do for orphans in Guatemala? What's the next best thing I can do for these babies? that are born not only in Guatemala, but our care house in Lenore. By the way, the first baby, that orphanage in Guatemala, we got a telephone call as we were opening. There's a two-hour-old baby out here in the trash dump. If you want it, come get it. Two hours old, we got it. She's 10 now. So I'm just saying, be creative. God gave us a mind. Three things here. Pray. Jesus prayed for Peter. You pray for her knee. Which knee is it? You pray for my knee. My left knee. I need your prayers. She needs your prayers. All God's children need your prayers. And then, at that point, have courage. Courage. Stand up for what you, courage is from a Latin word, cor, C-O-R, which means heart. You got to have heart. And then to stay at the peak, you need to be compassionate. To realize that everybody needs a figurative arm around them to say you matter. To look them in the eye and see what's really in their heart and in their soul. Jim and I had a phone call from one of our staff members coming up here today. I knew something's been wrong with it. I've seen it in her eyes. She confirmed that she's got some very serious illnesses, and we talked about it. Look at people. See beyond the facade. Look them in the eyes. Curious, creative, compassionate, courageous. The older I get, the more important that serenity prayer becomes to me. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's how you stay at the peak. Yep, that's great. You are one of the most respected people I know in Baptist life. I've, I've been in North Carolina for 28 and a half years, and uh, I've been in many meetings, and 
I have seen Baptists break up into groups and, and be contentious at times. Uh, but you have been able, just as you did the, this evening when you walked in here, you have been able to go from person to person, group to group. Everyone respects you. And I think a lot of that has to do with your spiritual walk, with your walk with, with the Lord. And uh, I'd like to know what you do to keep your spiritual life fresh and growing. The key to ministry, if not the key to life, is refreshment. A sabbatical like you've had, that was a tremendous time of discovery for you guys. Right. Tremendous time of discovery. Refreshment. The older I get, because I own all the time, from the time I go in, I mean, the, the, it's, 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 who, it's what I do, but it's also my personality. I was born with his personality. I just have my daddy all over again. He would have been over everybody here. The older I get, silence and beauty. Those are the two things that refresh me, along with Gabriella and Piper. Those are my two <laughs> granddaughters. And when I'm around them, oh my goodness, I'm just, uh, I, I don't know, I don't even know my own name. You know, they're just, they're just special. So, but refreshment is the key. And finding ways to renew your spirit. But now for me, at 77, it would be beauty and silence. Be still, God says. And know that I am God. So that's how I keep on keeping on. And get, try, try to get a good night's sleep. I said a long time ago, Jim asked me one time, he said, what's the key to success? I said, a good night's sleep. And every time we turn around now, we're reading about getting a good night's sleep. How many in here sleep eight straight hours a night without waking up at least once? <laughs> okay, well, you're, you know, what, 12? Uh, so <laughs> that could be expected. <laughs> I mean, you know, I can't say what I was going to say here, but uh, <laughs> no, no. I love you, but I can't say about that. But anyway, should I? And I think not. No, I don't think <laughs> no, no. But th the refreshment, that's the thing. And for me, it is beauty and it's silence. So in your book, you talk a lot about purpose. And I think a lot of times what keeps us from f fulfilling our purpose is our fear of failure. Uh, we live in a culture that is consumed by fear anyway. Um, how can you encourage folk to pursue purpose and, and, and fail without being a failure? Fear, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. <clears throat> Let me repeat that. False evidence appearing real. Somebody said F-E-A-R is forget everything and run, but, um, <laughs> and if there are certain bugs or tarantulas in here or ticks, which two of my friends have gotten bitten with, I'd probably be running. <laughs> but you, you just have to walk through it. You have to just say, I am not by myself with this. And so what if I fail? My goodness, my life has been marked by, by failing. That's where I learned my lessons. That does not mean you are a failure. I mean, everybody in here has failed at something, you know? I mean, I almost failed my freshman year at college because I never went to class, you know? <laughs> I was so obsessed with working at this local radio station that, you know, I barely had a 2.0 so I could go up to my sophomore year. Now, when I went to seminary, I, I made a decision that I was going to study. I was also married by that time, and I finished, you know, top of my class, but I had a purpose then. I didn't really have a purpose when I went off to Carolina. I'd probably done better taking what's called a gap year, you know, and just enjoying myself. You need to know what your passion is. What is your passion? What is it that, that just makes your heart sing? Whoa, yeah. What is it that makes your spirit soar? S-O-A-R. That's what your purpose is. Stick to it. 
go for it. And if you fail, just pick yourself up and dust yourself off and start all over again. Is that a song? I think it is. Yeah. Does that help? That helps, yeah. False evidence appearing real. Yeah, that's great. Last summer, you were the primary speaker at uh, Summerfest down at Fort Caswell, and uh, you were invited for a, a week twice. I was invited for an hour twice. <laughs> and, they and don't I, mention me, I, but all I can do is talk about him, you know, so who made the impression? They, they brought me down to tell stories, but y you were telling stories all the time. And, um, and a lot of my stories were about my growing up days and, and my childhood. And I, I would like for you to tell us just briefly where you grew up in North Carolina and, and maybe who or what in, in your childhood influenced you. I grew up in a mill village uh, on a mill hill in a mill house in Gastonia. Gastonia, uh, when I moved there in 1946, was a, was a quantum leap. My first four years had been spent in Belmont with indoor plumbing. Oh, that was mighty fine. <laughs> then my daddy moves us to Gastonia in a mill house. No more indoor plumbing. Huh. I don't even want to think about that. Some of you may have had that experience when you were young. It marked me in, in a lot of ways. But I lived, I'm an only child. I've got to tell you one quick story here about that. I was living in Kings Mountain at the time. My father worked third uh, shift at the Margrace Mill in Kings Mountain. My mother made sure I knew that she had 270 days of morning sickness. <laughs> 270 days. That's nine months. <laughs> so no surprise, I am an only child. My father's name was Cletus. Not tonight, Cletus. Not tonight, not next week, not anytime soon. So I am an only child. We moved to Belmont when I was six weeks old, lived and then moved to Gastonia. A house that was asbestos house, no underpinning, dirt road. Uh, everybody, I lived, I don't know if you ever saw my old house or not in Gastonia, I think you did. Literally in the shadow of a, of a cotton mill. And I could go outside and I could see the people walking from my neighborhood to work on the second shift and coming home from the first shift at two o'clock in the afternoon. The whole area was named after a two, a family, Groves family, Groves Mill, and one side named for a rock called Flint, Flint Groves. Flint Groves School, Flint Groves Church, Flint Groves Community, Flint Groves everything. I was on the Flint side. I went to Flint Groves Church, Baptist Church, baptized there at age eight, went to Flint Groves School. My first hero was my principal, Robert K. Hancock. He was a man that was brilliant beyond his time. He took out time every year to come to every single class and teach. In the eighth grade, he came in there and did a one plus one thing and did a whole blackboard, and it came out zero. I don't know how he did it, but we believed it. He was a man who absolutely inspired me in more ways than he would ever know. He retired when I was in the eighth grade. It was grades one through nine. I was asked on behalf of the student body to present his, his going away gift, which was a typewriter. He was a man that uh, uh, once a month that would bring you into the uh, auditorium and play classical music to you. Classical music to a bunch of lint heads. <laughs> and that's what we were called when you were, when you were raised in a cotton mill. It's a good word, it's a good word. And, uh, and so he was my first hero, three preachers, a guy named, um, Wilburn Hendricks, who told me that he wanted me to go to seminary, and I said, no, my career's in radio. Well, you say, who won that one? Love Dixon, who baptized me at Flint Groves, and then Hoyle Allred, who uh, married my wife and me and helped ordain me. So it was, I was, my father used to say that we were upper, lower class. And um, I never did understand what he meant by that. I don't know if I, I, I do even today. But it was a tight-knit little community. Somewhere around the sixth grade, uh, they, they paved uh, the front road in our house, and we got indoor plumbing, and I just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. 
I loved where I was in the ninth grade. I got this job at this radio station. I used to ride my little trusty bicycle down for a platter party, uh, two to four on Saturday afternoon, and then uh, the half hour on Sunday. When I was 15, I got a full-time job across uh, the, the radio station across town. Got paid a dollar an hour. 1958, that was big bucks. I, I saved enough to pay my first year at Carolina, and I had a program called Mickey's Record Shop. And I loved that, and the little 45 RPM records. And so I worked hard. I've always been hardwired. Uh, when I was five years old, my mother's family was in Gaffney, and my father was going down uh, Cherokee Avenue, and a reporter came up with a portable a tape recorder, and he said, son, what do you want to be when you grow up? Five years old. I said, I want to be a preacher. Well, how'd that turn out for me? I guess that's what I'm still doing today. <laughs> the personality I have now is what I had when I was five years old. It's why I never made above a C in deportment. Deportment, you remember what that, that is? I, you know, I talked too much, <laughs> you know, and I probably still do, so I need to shut up. <laughs> In your book, uh, one of the essentials that you talk about is health and living a healthy lifestyle. So the question, when I read that section, the question I wrote uh, down was, do you really think it is possible to be successful at work, spend time with family, be active in church and community, and live a healthy lifestyle? Yeah, I do think it is. You have to work at it. Uh, some people uh, have the genetic uh, ability, capability, the gift of health. Some people at early ages have things that is beyond their control. Uh, onset of juvenile diabetes and, you know, things like that or certain other kinds of things. What you have to do is to seek balance. That's so important and absolutely essential uh, to, to have uh, a, a time of meditation, a time of exercise, a time of diet, whatever that all kind of combines in there to be the med formula, I call it. Uh, uh, that would be uh, exercise, meditation, and diet. And try to leave a lead a balanced life. When I, when I go home at night, I try to go home. I, I'm on so much, but when that, when that flag goes up and says off duty, I want to do what I can to be off duty. I got a lot of work to do with that because I'm, I'm hello, <laughs> yes dear, mm -hmm. I have trouble with this thing, you know, I mean I wake up in the middle of the night and you know and I'm looking to see what's there. Anybody else have that addiction? That's what it is. You know, but I'm not on Facebook. Thank goodness I'm not on Facebook. And I turned this thing off before I came in here tonight. So that's one of the, the things that you have to be careful with is you can get these kind of addictions when you're looking for positive addiction right. and not negative addiction. Now, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, how do, how, how do you live a healthy lifestyle? Well, fortunately, I have a wife of 32 years who is, is truly devoted to making sure that I eat right. I mean, I go down, it's basically the same uh, every morning. Uh, you know, I want some protein, so I have some fried eggs. I have a little muffin. I have some uh, uh, butter on that, maybe a little uh, homemade jelly or something like that. She likes to send me off. You have a little snack during the day. You want to make sure you get enough protein. You want to get enough vegetables. You want to have a balanced diet, if at all possible. Uh, I've been to nutritionists, probably about 110 of them, and all of them say the same thing. And Mr. Blackwell, you can eat about 1,500, 1,600 calories a day, do some exercise, and you'll be fine. Well, Mr. Blackwell, all you need to do is to eat about 1,500, 1,600 calories a day, get a little exercise, do some arm weights, don't forget that, and don't forget that the grip is the most important thing that you have when you're growing older. You, you, your strength is measured by your grip. I just take it all in, go home and do what I've been doing for the last 35 years. <laughs> talk, talk to us, uh, one of your essentials is relationships. Yeah. Uh, what does it take to have meaningful relationships? The, the main thing about relationships is quality. It's quality relationships. Uh, we, can have a, we can have quantity relationships. I know a lot of people. I, I probably know as many Baptist people uh, as anybody in this state. 
but you get, the relationships are quality. A number of years ago, our most effective initiative was called QSTQR, Quality Service Through Quality Relationships. That went with our vendors, that went with our pastors, that went with our churches, and that went with each other. Quality relationships. Here's the key to quality relationships. It's called connectivity. Connectivity. Find somebody that you can connect with. Choose your friends carefully. If you want to be a friend, then you need to be a friend. If you want to have a friend, you need to be a friend. It's quality, not quantity. Think about that in your own life now. How many friends do you have that would take the 3 a.m. call? How many friends do you have that you could tell anything to, any secret to, any desire to? How many friends do you have like that? If you've got that many, you're a little bit above the average. So choose your friends carefully, quality, built on trust, respect, and love. When you do that, you have relationships that you have to nurture. They don't just happen. One of the things that is painful, 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 is when a relationship breaks up. It can be a marriage relationship breaking up. But something that's really painful is when best friends break up. And man, that's the old Neil Sedaka song, breaking up is hard to do. When somebody who's been a friend and a confidant to you for 10, 15, 20 years suddenly breaks up. I had that happen. That took me probably two or three years to get over that. I never didn't know exactly what happened there. So choose these relationships carefully. It's not all give and it's not all take. But it is a give and take and listen. Listen to what your friend is saying. Hear what it is. Everybody wants to be Everybody wants to be valued. Everybody wants to be appreciated. Choose your friends wisely. Nurture their friendship. Major on quality relationships through quality service to one another. You have the gift of connecting with people, that's obvious. And, and I have noticed you've connected with some of the young people here tonight right from the very beginning. Uh, before we conclude, is there anything you would like to, for them especially to take away from tonight? The young people? Yes. Yeah, I, you know, I, I said a little bit earlier, and my first job, by the way, was Minister of Youth at a church in Raleigh. I graduated seminary in 1970. I had a period of time between 64 when I graduated college and uh, 67, when I worked at this radio station in Charlotte, met my wife, we got married in 67. Uh, start out the way you want to end up. Start out the way you want to end up. You got a dream now. You know, I had a dream in the sixth and seventh grade. I knew something. When I was in the seventh grade, now I don't know what year this would have been, somewhere in the 50s, there were two TV stations in Charlotte, WBTV, and WSOC, CBS, and NBC, uh, NBC. I used to have this black and white um, Teleking television set. And I would sit in front of it and make me a little booth in seventh grade. And so when that, they would say, this is CBS, I'd turn it down. WBT Charlotte, or rather it was WBT Charlotte, and my voice hadn't changed yet. <laughs> so I knew, and, and by the way, it cracked on the air one time uh, when I was in the ninth grade. I was doing the radio station, and it started WLTC, and I dropped about two octaves on the air. I wish I had that. So I knew early on there, there was something there. There was that itch of communicating that I knew was there, and it's never left me. To be able to communicate effectively is what I try to do today. 
My mission is still to inspire people to be great and never give up on their dreams. And so that's what I want to say to the young people here. Find your niche, stay where you are comfortable, and sometimes be a little uncomfortable along the way. If anybody ever says to you, that's ridiculous. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Then you know you're on the right track. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know you're on the right track. Yeah. Tonight we've been talking about essentials for living. How would you like to be remembered? I was so afraid you were going to ask that question. <laughs> I should have done a little homework on that. I think that probably my legacy is kind of already out there and people are, have formed a lot out of it already. I truly do hope that if I've been able to plant a seed of optimism and hope in people that that seed will have taken hold and will sprout some other little seedlings along the way. I want to be remembered as a daggone good daddy and a really, really good boppy. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I, an amazing husband. Other than that, I don't give too much of a flip because that's what's essential. I want to know what my kids think. I want to know what my wife thinks. I want to know what my grandchildren think. And if they think that Boppy or Daddy is good and my wife still gets all pitter-patter every time she sees me in the morning, you know, I mean, what else is there? You know, I feel like I've led a good life I want to continue to lead a good life, and when I leave it behind, and I'm going to be cremated and buried on the campus of Mills Home in Thomasville, and I'm expecting you, Dupree, to come down and visit me at least once a year. There, <laughs> on that, and right there, just right there. We'll I asked, up, didn't I? I won't yeah. take up a lot of space, yeah. but just come down and say, I knew this man, and he was a good man. Yeah. And I want some of you, you're going to come down on both good knees. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dr. Michael C. Blackwell. Thank you. Thank you. Sit right there. Now. I, I'm going to close this in prayer, and then Dr. Blackwell is going to be here at the table to my left, and we have books for you tonight, and you can come by and get a book before you leave, and he will be happy to sign it happy. for you. So he's going to stay and do that. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for all that we have seen and heard and experienced tonight. Thank you for Dr. Blackwell. Thank you for his wonderful ministry and for the time that he has spent with us this evening. We have been blessed and we've been encouraged. And I, I just pray, Lord, that we would go forth from this place realizing that life is a gift from you. You bless us each day with that gift. And I pray that we would use it for your honor and your glory in all that we say and all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.